and we have Kristen Ojak. Am I saying it right? Yes, hard J, you got it. Good. And so Kristen is a nurse practitioner in the Atlanta area who uh, started a practice called Stat Wellness, and they do uh, a lot of functional medicine. And this is something that I think is massive. I'm always, listen, there's, there's traditional medicine, and then there's off-beaten path medicine, there's naturopathic medicine, and I've been a huge fan of functional medicine in, in our world for many, many years now. I look at certain conditions like erectile dysfunction as, a, as the prime example of a urologic patient that needs functional medicine. In other words, someone, a guy comes in, uh, he's having some ED, but he's also overweight, he's also snoring, he's eating terribly, his gut is a mess, and I can do so much with my testosterone and Viagra, Kristen is, they're going to make it all better for the rest of the body. And so uh, when, when I started working with Kristen many, many months ago, I felt that, you know, there's a, a, a talk in functional medicine in our oncology patients would be, would be fantastic. And so we put this little, she put this little talk together. I'm going to run the slides. We're going to make sure that everybody's working here. Okay. Everybody's working good. We're working nicely. And so I'm going to have Kristen introduce herself and go from there. Kristen, all you. Awesome. Well, I'm seeing the disclaimer side. Uh, oh. Boom. Slide. There we go. There Boom. I am without glasses on. Um, so as Dr. Greenstein said, I am the founder of Stat Wellness and Stat Wellness actually stands for Strength to Achieve Total Wellness. And it's kind of a play on words because it started when I worked in the emergency room and everybody wanted everything stat. And I realized, you know, wellness really isn't achieved stat. So kind of a bad name that it's like stat wellness, but it really is strength to achieve total wellness. And we take a functional medicine approach, but we also believe in the power of functional movement. So we are the nation's first medicine and movement practice. So one third of our space, when you look at the physical space is functional medicine and two thirds is a gym and personal training because we really value community accountability. We want to give you the knowledge through medicine, but we want to show you through movement, how you can become your best self. Um, I have my doctorate, which is a terminal degree for nurses, and my whole uh, doctorate or dissertation was on digestive health. So I have a huge passion for gut dysfunction. I look a lot at the gut microbiome. I look at how you're digesting, how you're absorbing, because the gut really is the gateway to our health. And even as we think of cancer, that's where our immune system starts. That's where a lot of inflammation begins. And a lot of that is driven by the foods that we're consuming, um, the bacteria and things that we're exposed to. So I function as a family nurse practitioner. I'm also a personal trainer. And then I'm a certified provider through the Institute of Functional Medicine. And as we were talking about before this got started, I have a baby seven month old at home that is crazy. Um, and I have a wonderful husband. Uh, I never like to be identified only by my work. Are we going to have one of those videos where your daughter's going to come crawling on through? You know, <laughs> I'm actually at the office right now where she would. She's, yeah, she's an active one. Nice. Just tell me when you want the next slide. Ooh, that's me. Well, this one's you. Right. Yeah. So I guess I'll talk about myself. So Mark Greenstein, I'm a urologist at Advanced Urology in the Sandy Springs location. I graduated medical school in 1997, did a six-year residency. Uh, practiced urology uh, since 2003. I moved here uh, three years ago and have been building the Sandy Springs location, I think, very nicely. And one of the, like I said, one of the opportunities I've had is to branch out and work with the great providers that we have in the Atlanta area. Uh, many, many moons ago, uh, I got some nice little nomination from Vital's website and a magazine in New Jersey. I'm very involved in, or in the past, I was very involved with pediatric epilepsy that took a little hold when I moved out in New Jersey, but we'll see what that future brings. And we have a lot of mutual patients and you are the doctor that listens and cares, which is great. So um, it's really say? nice. What'd you say? Just kidding. You, you, oh. <laughs> 
no, I see, I see. Uh -huh. um, so I wanted to first talk about what functional medicine is, because I think a lot of people, when they hear the term functional medicine, just think of like integrative, holistic alternatives. And we do take a holistic approach, but we really are systems biology based. And and we really like to follow evidence. Our biggest thing that makes functional medicine different is primarily we're cash pay. So we're able to spend a lot of time with our patients. So our new patient visits are always an hour of face-to-face -face time, not an hour like doing an intake with the nurse, an hour with senior healthcare provider. You know, it is a true, we're sitting down and, and we're talking through your whole health timeline. And so we start at your birth. We want to know if you were a vaginal delivery or C-section. We want to know if you were breastfed or not. We want to know what kind of diet you had growing up. If you're a female, I want to know about what your cycle was like when it first started. Have you been on birth control? Have you had an IUD? How many children have you had? Um, we look for any kind of emotional trauma, maybe like your parents parents had a really bad divorce. Maybe you really you failed out of school and it was a huge thing for your identity. So we look at all those different things along the way because your health today is really a picture of the past and, and present, but your lifestyle leading up to today really does play a role in your health and we can always turn it around. And so we really look at your diet, your relationships. We're also really big into genetics and environment, which I'll touch on a little bit in this PowerPoint. Um, we really put a lot of emphasis on sleep, stress management. And I really love this image from the Institute of Functional Medicine because this is some, kind of summarizes our whole approach of kind of uncovering that root cause. So you can have one condition, which is in the center, depression, that's caused by many different things. So it can be an omega-3 fatty acid issue. It can be a low thyroid. It can be vitamin D deficiency, pre-diabetes, and unstable blood sugar throughout the day. Chronic antibiotic use causing dysbiosis or an imbalance of good and bad bacteria in your gut because we know about 90% of our serotonin is made in our gut. So depression can be rooted in different causes, depending on the person. Of course, there's a lot of other causes, but that's a quick picture. Then on the right side, you have one cause in functional medicine. We look at inflammation as a whole that can cause a lot of conditions. So if you have a lot of inflammation, you could have heart disease diabetes, it can turn into cancer, arthritis, depression. So it is, we're always peeling back the onion. It's very rarely just one piece of the puzzle that we have to put in place. It's usually a combination of several things, but I just wanted to give you examples of how we look at one condition from different causes and a lot of different causes and many conditions. We can go to the next one. So cancer, because tonight is all about cancer and, and functional medicine lenses, I wanted to first talk about what cancer is. Of course, cancer is super complex. It's not a simple thing, but when you really think about it, it's abnormal cells in the body that are growing uncontrollably. And so we really target inflammation. We target your immune system, and we really want to support you along your journey. And this is really important in the United States because of the um, stats on the next slide. I'm sure you guys all listening know somebody that's been diagnosed with cancer. Um, it is very, very prevalent. So if you look at some 2020 statistics, there's over a million new cases of cancer diagnosed in the United States just in 2020 alone. That is a lot. Out of that, 606,520 will die from cancer. Not, of course, the ones that are newly diagnosed, but that's almost, a, I mean, that's half a million people every single year that are dying from cancer. There's a lot of cancers out there. Some of the most common ones, breast, lung, prostate, colon, um, approximately 39.5% of men and women will be diagnosed with cancer at some point in their life. And that statistic right there is what's so mind blowing to me. That's 40%. So we all know somebody that's had cancer. We know people that have survived from cancer. We know people that have died from cancer and our approach from functional medicine. And I'll show you a study. I don't know if it's on the next one or um, a little bit over, but our approach is to really work with you and conventional medicine. I don't know if you want to go to the next slide. So this is the study that I was referring to. Combination therapy is best. And so I wanted to make sure before we get into some of the functional medicine principles that they did a study in 2018 and they found that people that declined conventional medicine and followed alternative therapy only had a much higher death rate when it came to cancer. So our approach is not to come in here and tell you not to do anything that's recommended by your specialist. Our approach is to be adjunct and support you through the journey. And it is again, never too late to make lifestyle changes because it will make a difference. And there's lots of studies I referenced throughout this PowerPoint of 
you make a change with your diet and the slowed progression of the tumor or getting into remission. So again, it's not the only thing to do, but if we can slow the progression while you're doing treatment, or if we can at least support you in the side effects associated with treatment, that's what we're here to do. So I basically talked about this, so we can go to the next one. So here's some different things. When we meet with a patient that's been recently diagnosed with cancer, or maybe you're being very proactive because you're like, wow, 40% of people are going to develop cancer at some point in their life, or you have a strong family history of cancer. We get a lot of people that come in and they're like, every female in my family has had breast cancer. And I want to like be very proactive and I want to be on top of it. And so we do a lot of prevention and we do a lot of working with patients that have been diagnosed with cancer. But some of the big things that we're looking at is nutritional support. We're looking at reducing inflammation. When you look at inflammation, you cannot be inflamed without activating your immune system system. So inflammation and immune activation kind of follow the same cascade on a physical standpoint within our body. So if we have a ton of inflammation, we're going to have immune dysfunction. We're going to have abnormal cells in our body. And so we really work on reducing the inflammation and making your immune system smarter. Uh, and again, we improve side effects. We prioritize lifestyle stress management, and then we work on the prevention side. So we're going to break down those different areas. So I always want to be the empowering force. And I want to talk about the things that we can control. I don't spend a lot of time talking about all the things we can't control because there's a lot in functional medicine that we are empowered over. We have the ability to choose what we put in and out of our mouth. We have the ability to choose exercise or not. We have the ability to say, I'm going to stop smoking or I'm going to keep smoking and I'm going to be constantly addicted to the cigarette. It is a choice. Um, we have the ability to change our perspective. If you guys probably know people that experience very similar stress. One person, their perspective of stress, they don't process it well. The other person, you're like, they never seem stressed out, but you know that they have stress because we all have stress. So it's really a subjective thing of how we're processing and our perspective. And that is the thing that negatively impacts your physical health because stress mentally, yes, it can cause depression and anxiety, but it's the physical effects of stress. And in order for you to have the physical effects of stress, your mind has to perceive it as stressful. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, body composition is something we do look a lot at and not for vanity reasons. We do not care about the number on the scale, but what we do care about is how much visceral fat do you have, which is the deep fat that's around your organs. How much body fat percent do you have? We know body fat drives up insulin and it drives up inflammation. So do we want you to have low body fat? No, especially as a female, you need that body fat to make hormones. And this is not, you know, trying to lead to eating disorders and things like that. It's our goal is disease prevention, cancer management. And we know that we got to keep a healthy body composition to decrease our risk of cancer from developing and to also improve the outcomes. Sleep, we can choose whether we're going to stay up and be what Washington Post has called, I think, the sleep procrastinator. Um, those are people that go their whole day and they're working, working, and it's the first time they have for themselves. And so they want to do all their fun stuff at night. And so they keep delaying their bedtime and um, they're getting, you know, five hours of sleep, which we know based on studies is going to really negatively impact your overall health. Sun exposure. I know that's probably a random thing to include in here, but skin cancer is so prevalent in the United States and we have the opportunity to put sunscreen on and protect our skin. And then the environment to an extent we have control over. And when I'm referring to the environment, I'm referring to what we're putting in on our body and what we're breathing in, in our environment. So we have, you know, depending on the person and, and what all um, they have access to from financial abilities, but we have the ability to choose, okay, I'm going to use something a little bit more simple than this lotion that has 500 ingredients and all these chemicals that I can't pronounce that I put on my body twice a day. Your skin's the largest organ, so it absorbs those things in. And we work with our patients within budgets. We're not talking about spending hundreds of dollars on these products, but simplifying it, maybe looking at the environmental working group and looking at the skin database and plugging in like, okay, I wear deodorant every day. How can you find a deodorant that's a little bit healthier um, because you're putting it right where your lymph nodes are and your lymph nodes, you're absorbing all of that in and it's getting into circulation. Those small swaps that you make, not necessarily having to spend more money, but just being aware can make a huge difference. Thinking about our tap water. You can go to environmental working group, you can go to their water database, and you can type in your zip code, and you can look at what's in your tap water. And I promise you when you do this, 
you won't drink tap water anymore. You'll switch over to filtered water, whether it's a cheap filter or an expensive filter, you're still processing some of that out. And it's really mind blowing how many known carcinogens are in our water, how many people throw their medications down the toilet that gets into our water system and we ingest it and we're 60% water. So you can get the next one. So I love this quote, um, genes load the gun, environment and nutrients pull the trigger. Depending on the resource or the study that you look at, anywhere from 10 to 25% is our genetics. The other 90 to 75% is what we can control. And there are several studies that have done longitudinal studies over time, and they've looked at people like twins in different environments and how does it impact our health. So when people come into me and they say, oh, well, I'm just going to develop high blood pressure, it's genetic. We all have high blood pressure in my family. I said, yeah, 10 to 25% of that is probably true, but the other 75 to 90%, I do think you can control, and we're going to work together and reverse your risk of developing high blood pressure or talk about other ways we can manage your high blood pressure. So genes are not a crutch to say why you got something. It is important to know about your genetics and your know your family history because it is uh, it does predispose you to things, but it is not the only thing. Um, and then we look at we look a lot into research at epigenetics and nutrigenomics. And all that means is how does your environment play a role on genetic expression? And my favorite is this whole science of nutrigenomics, which is really fairly new, like early 2000s that we started getting a lot more into methylation. And that term methylation is basically, and some of you that have taken chemistry or um, you know any of those classes may remember learning about the methylation cycle forever and ever ago. And then we just never talked about it again. Like I had never heard of it at all through my bachelor's, my master's or my doctorate, did we ever cover methylation? But I started learning more about it when we started to learn more about autism and ADD and ADHD and bipolar and cancers and all these different things. And I got so excited about it because this is not like genetics related to Down syndrome, where you are born and we cannot alter those genes. Nutrigenomics, we can alter them by dietary changes, by taking the right form of vitamins. So a very common one in conventional medicine that you guys may have heard of is called MTHFR. And that gene takes folic acid, which is synthetic, and converts it over to methyl tetrahydrofolate that your body can use. So a lot of people have never been tested for MTHFR, and we know they have a higher risk of heart disease, miscarriages, and cancers. And so if we can look and know, okay, you have MTHFR, what is your homocysteine? What is your folate level? Let's make sure you're getting good for, uh, sources of folate, but maybe we need to supplement a methylfolate and get your homocysteine down. That's gonna help your body process, break down things. And the cool thing is when you think simply of nutrigenomics, we're looking at turning on and off genes. Can we change the expression of genes? And that's what the whole area is. And it's very exciting and empowering to know we can make changes. So nutrients, obviously the list of nutrients that are important in the cancer patient goes on and on and on. There's so many, but I wanted to narrow it down to my four favorites and that is zinc, vitamin C, vitamin D and omega-3s. And I kind of break each of these down from food sources where you can get these and also different um, ways of getting them. So we can go to zinc, which it should be the first one up. So a lot of people think about zinc when they get a cold, they go to get the zincies, lozenges, or they start taking zinc. Um, but the interesting thing is our body doesn't store zinc the same way it does some of the fat soluble vitamins. So we can quickly become deficient if we're not getting zinc from food. It is a mineral in the body, but it has a lot of antioxidant properties. And antioxidant is something that we hear a lot, which is really important in the cancer world, because what antioxidants do is they help to get rid of oxidative stress. Stress. And what oxidative stress does is it really makes our cells age quicker than they should. So it starts to make our DNA and RNA become fragmented. It starts to damage our cells. It can start having this abnormal cell turnover. So we do not want oxidative stress in the body. And we have a test that actually measures that in our patients to see how much oxidative stress do they have and how are their antioxidants? Do you have enough 
glutathione, vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin C, zinc, all these different things. But it really influences our immune system. It really plays a role with cell uh, proliferation and turnover, which is really important. Our DNA and RNA synthesis and repair. So when you think about the mechanism of how zinc works, it's really important in the cancer space, in the prevention and in the management. And we really recommend checking zinc levels. You don't wanna just guess that your levels look good. And the kind of cool thing is zinc and copper need to be in balance. And so we'll often see if somebody's copper level gets too high, it will suppress their zinc. So we like to look at both copper and zinc to make sure that those minerals are in balance because that's gonna support your immune system. We really like to focus a lot on getting things from food. So things like chicken and eggs and sea, seafood, beans, peas, lentils, nuts and seeds, oysters, all of those things are rich in zinc. Um, zinc also just for the male patients out there is really important for testosterone production. So we have a lot of men with suboptimal testosterone levels and we check their zinc and it's really deficient. So if you optimize the zinc, we see in, in, um, improvements naturally in testosterone, which is great, especially for a cancer cancer patient that can't do testosterone therapy. Vitamin C, this is one of our favorites here at Stat Wellness when it comes to the cancer patient. It is very controversial when you look at high dose vitamin C. Um, there are some really good studies that are very promising with high dose vitamin C. And then there's some that say that, you know, they looked at patients with cancer and they looked at placebo and they really didn't see improvements. There are so many studies that I could reference and send to you, but the reference article I cited on here is basically just like a summary that talks about some of the evidence that's out there. So you can see some of the different studies, but high dose vitamin C is something that's been used in Japan and China for a really long time with cancer therapy. And so they have more studies. Um, the cool thing is that this is not a conversation that's ended. Conventional medicine is still trying to understand is high dose vitamin C beneficial or not. Uh, a Mayo Clinic came out and they did a study and they said it's not uh, beneficial, but they were doing oral vitamin C at 10 grams, where a lot of the studies that were done on high dose vitamin C, they were administered IV and they were at doses of up to hundred grams, which is hundred thousand milligrams, which is not comparable at all to 10,000 milligrams orally based on absorption. So when you look at the studies, you really want to try to break down like what form of vitamin C were they doing and how were they using it? This is something that we use in conjunction with conventional medicine and we work with the oncologist. Most oncologists that we've worked with are very okay with their patients getting high dose vitamin C, uh, but we always like to run it by them. There is a test that you have to do first that's a G6PD to make sure that you're not deficient because if you are and you get high dose vitamin C, your red blood cells, it's rare, but they can bust open. So obviously you wouldn't be able to do it. So we check that before administering it. Um, it can drop your blood sugar as well, which which is also an added benefit. So you'll see in this reference article, if you go and read it, they talk about this is, and as we get into nutrition, so important. Our cancer cells pull up glucose even more than our regular cells. So when our blood sugar is elevated, when our insulin is high, you are feeding those cancer cells. And so high dose vitamin C also lowers your blood sugar, which is very helpful because we want to starve those cancer cells from glucose and sugar. So very important. Of course, there's natural sources of vitamin C. When we're talking about these powerful antioxidant uh, properties, we're really referring more to the high dose vitamin C and the cancer kind of treatment in conjunction with conventional medicine. But you can always eat these natural oranges, grapefruits, tomatoes, strawberries, red bell pepper, uh, lemons, limes, of course, are also vitamin C. Um, so, but you know, I, I found it interesting that still over 7% of Americans have critically low vitamin C causing scurvy. Um, and if you go back to, and I don't remember if it was the 1700s or 1800s, but that is like what killed the most Navy and military was scurvy. They were dying of vitamin C deficiencies and they found lemon and oranges for solving it. And the, the Navy seals on the boats weren't dying, which is fascinating that a nutrient like vitamin C can be so important. Vitamin D, super, super important. It's a fat soluble vitamin. You get D2 and D3. D2 is made from plants where D3 is synthesized through our skin from humans. Um, both of the forms, D2, D3, are both converted in the liver to the more active form. And then the kidneys kind of help with the final step. 
it is very difficult to get enough vitamin D from the sun. And this is something that we do not just guess, we test levels and we are very particular about where we like vitamin D. The conventional reference range is 30 to 100. And if you're at 31, they often won't tell you that vitamin D is a problem. But if you're at 29, they'll have you start a vitamin D because it's flagged low. We really like it in men to be at least 50 and women to be at least 60, but we really strive in both genders for a 60 to 80. There doesn't seem to be any added benefit when you get to be 90, 100, 110, but when you're low in vitamin D, it is going to impact your immune system. Vitamin D is an immune, it's actually a hormone, um, not really even just a vitamin, but it has immune modulating properties. And the most research, when you go on to PubMed and you really look at it as colorectal cancers, that's really where we're seeing the most research. So I always say if you have a family history of colon cancer, really make sure your vitamin D is optimal and keep it optimal. Um, and the reason it's hard to get it from the sun, clothes, sunscreen, block the synthesis. So if you're taking care of your skin and trying to prevent skin cancer, and you're going outside, you know, and you've got sunscreen on, you're putting 70 on, 40 on, you're not synthesizing the vitamin D. Um, and most of us aren't walking around naked without sunscreen on to really synthesize all that vitamin D. Maybe Dr. Greenstein is, but I know <laughs> I'm not. Um, <laughs> Um, and there are not very many natural sources of vitamin D from food. Fatty fish, if you leave the skin on, especially you get some vitamin D. Eggs, you get some vitamin D. Mushrooms, they do fortify foods like milks and cereals. A lot of the fortified food are not as healthy. Um, but almost, I would say 90% of my patients, when I check their level, I have them take a vitamin D. I, th I think it's one of the most important things. And then omega-3 fatty acids, the last one, this one is really important for inflammation. And there was a good study that I uh, referenced on here that helped with side effects and treatment. So when we think of chemo or radiation side effects like pain, anorexia, depression, they really found that high dose fatty acids really helped with inflammation, reducing the pain, helping to increase the appetite and boosting the mood. Omega-3 fatty acids are really helpful for brain health and cognition. So when you're going through any kind of treatment, getting some good omega-3s can be very helpful. One thing I always like to add, and I hope, um, you know, whoever is doing any surgeries or operations, let you know, but omega-3s are one of the things, and later in this curcumin, that really thin your blood. So make sure when you go and see your conventional healthcare provider that you disclose what you're taking supplement-wise, because it's important to stop it before procedures, um, or they will have a very hard time clotting your blood, um, especially if you're taking our therapeutic doses, which is 2,000 to 3,000 milligrams. There are a lot of omega-3 rich foods. And as we get into nutrition, we're gonna talk about Mediterranean diet because that's one of the longest standing diets that's been researched primarily for heart disease. That's really where like large seven country studies were done. But it's also really helpful for cancer and inflammation. And what the problem is in the United States is we have such an omega-6 rich diet. So we eat a lot of vegetable oils. We eat a lot of processed foods. We're opening boxes all day, getting crackers, goldfish, Cheez-Its, whatever it is. I always tell patients, if you're opening it from a box, chances are it's rich in omega-6s and you're not getting omega-3s. And it's not that omega-6s are bad. The problem is in America, our ratios are really off. So you'll see on um, towards the end of this, I talk about some of the common labs we check and omega checks is a big one that we look at looking at your omega three versus six ratio. And we want to see, do you have enough omega threes in relation to your omega sixes? And a lot of Americans, unless they're very mindful, their ratio is super, super off, which is going to drive up inflammation can lead to depression, ADD, ADHD, any of those kind of brain health things, heart health, really important. So natural forms of omega-3s to incorporate into your diet, salmon, cod, ground flaxseed, flax oil, chia seeds, walnuts. So I'll do like overnight oats or just overnight chia seed pudding. And I'll put chia seeds, ground flax seeds, walnuts, all of that in a mason jar with some like coconut milk that's unsweetened because I love the flavor of coconut milk. With that, I'll put some berries on top. And it's a great omega-3 rich breakfast to have that's pre-made. Um, I try, even though I do not like salmon, I try to eat salmon a few times a week because it's lower in mercury. Some of the large fish that we really like, the mahi-mahi, the tuna, 
the grouper, those have more mercury. And the National Resource Defense Counselor, NRDC, released mercury in fish. Um, I think they do it once a year at least. I don't know how often it changes, but they have the highest mercury fish, the high mercury, the moderate, and the low. And it's just something important to be mindful of because let's say you have dental fillings and you eat fish or sushi multiple times per week, we actually do see a lot of high mercury, which can drive up inflammation and, de and hinder your detox pathways. Uh, mercury and zinc also bind together. So if you have really high mercury, you're going to have a harder time keeping your zinc up. So just a few things to think about. So dietary recommendations, this is such a sensitive subject, depending on who you talk to. People in the dietary space feel so strongly about whatever diet they think is best. You guys are probably aware of this. If you're on Instagram, if you're on Facebook, if you watch TV, you see people, they get in their head that this is the best diet. We have a different approach here. Not one diet is best for everybody. There, I have people that go on a keto diet and they become a lot more inflamed and their cholesterol goes up. I have people that go on a keto diet, their inflammation goes down, their cholesterol looks fantastic. So we cannot say that, Todd, you need to be on a keto diet. That is for sure the best option for you. It's the only diet that you can be on. It just doesn't work that way. We're all different. Our gut microbiomes are different. Our genetics are different. The way we process carbs, protein, and fat are different. But as it relates to cancer, the three that I think have the most promising results is a keto diet, a vegan diet, and a Mediterranean diet. And you may say those are three totally different diets. If you're not familiar with them, keto is where you eat really high fat. About 70% of your calories come from fat. It's moderate protein. So it's lower in protein and very, very, very low in carbs. Everybody is different when it comes to a keto diet of how many carbs they can handle and still be in ketosis. I have done every single one of these. I do every diet my patients have done to experiment and see and learn what was hard on this diet, what wasn't, how did I feel? Keto for me did not work well at all. I had to have 25 grams of carbs or less to stay in ketosis. Broccoli, for example, would get me out of ketosis, where I have patients that can have 50 to 75 grams of carbs, and they're in ketosis. And in order to get the benefit of a keto diet as it relates to cancer, you really need to be in ketosis. So you need to measure in your urine, do you have ketones? And the deeper you get into ketosis, the better the outcome is with cancer. And the real benefit here, and I'm sure you guys maybe know because I mentioned it earlier, it's how low carb and sugar it is. You are starving your cancer cells because they love glucose. Cancer cells, are thr they thrive on it. So when you have high blood sugar, a standard American diet, every time you're eating these high processed carbs, this, you're drinking soda on your way to work, you are feeding that cancer. And that is where we believe that food is medicine and we need to use food as medicine, not by itself, but in conjunction. So that is the real benefit of keto, but we're going to talk about some of the really negative things and that not all keto is created equal. You can't be sitting there having full fat dairy and bacon. Kristen, can you yeah. just explain what ketosis is? Ketosis, so it's where your body switches from using glucose as fuel to using fat for fuel. So you become very fat adapt. And so your body is burning fat and it is your own fat, but it's also the fat you're consuming for energy. So there usually is a transient period where you may not feel as good. And they call it the keto flu because your whole life, your body is run on glucose for fuel. And now you're switching and you're using fat for fuel. So your body has to adapt and become a fat adaptive machine. And and, you know, one of the big questions I had at the beginning was, well, how does it impact athletic performance? We know muscles need glucose, but when you become very fat adapt and you do an anti-inflammatory keto diet, which is a huge thing that we're going to talk about, that's where all the emphasis is, um, there are studies where athletes, they performed even better. It, it, the deeper they got into ketosis and the better fat adapt their body was, the better they did. But I work with my patients because there is tons of studies that look at processed meat and cancer, that look at red meat and cancer. So red meat and processed meats, that fits into a keto diet. You could eat bacon, tons of bacon every morning, and you could have steak for lunch and dinner, 
And that would be a great thing to keep you in ketosis. The problem is though, what the studies show is higher red meat consumption and higher processed meat is correlated to more cancers, but those are not the only forms of fats. So how can we add more avocado, add more olives, add more olive oil, um, even doing some ghee butter, you know, something that is, um, they, they process it a little differently or grass fed butter. The reason we put emphasis on grass fed is because of that omega three and six ratio. So when you have grass grain fed chicken, when you have grain fed steak, all of those things that are more grain and corn fed, their omega sixes in the meat is higher. When you have a more grass fed uh, animal source, the omega threes are higher. And that's one of the reasons that we have a preference over it because we already have an issue where we have too much omega sixes. So really, really important to understand. The vegan diet has been really studied for cancer as well. And it's the exact opposite as a keto diet if you think about what you're eating. And when we talk about keto, again, it's anti-inflammatory. We are not talking about Atkins diet, which is what the bacon, the red meat, the heavy whipping cream, all of that, that can drive up inflammation. Um, the vegan diet is where you cut out all animal pro pro uh, products, including eggs, dairy, butter, everything. Um, some even vegans won't have honey because it's from bees. So it is like no animal products at all. Uh, I think one of the benefits there is you put so much emphasis on whole foods. You're not consuming processed foods and you get a lot of fiber. And the reason that fiber is so important and that's what's lacking on the keto diet is fiber is a prebiotic and prebiotics feed the good bacteria in our gut. So when we don't have fiber, we have really big gut changes. And why is that important with our cancer patients? Because that's where our immune system stems. So if you're not having daily bowel movements, you're not detoxing well. So you have to have daily bowel movements. If, if you're constipated, that's a problem. Um, if you're having diarrhea, that's also a problem because you're having probably malabsorption. So we want, if you know the Br Bristol stool chart, we want a nice type four, um, but very important to have a healthy gut. So our keto patients, we'll even talk to them about making sure they're getting fiber from either low carb veggies or adding a fiber supplement, things like acacia fiber or psyllium husk or something like that to make sure they're having enough fiber and having daily bowel movements. And then Mediterranean diet kind of, and we're going to talk about some of the common themes here, but lots of veggies good in omega-3 rich fatty acids, lots of fish, lots of anti-inflammatory foods. And again, inflammation, a big driver of cancer. So these diets each have their own benefit and they've all have studies. So I can find research that says, yes, do it. And research that says, no, do it for almost every single one of these, but we have to figure out what works best for you. Let's say you don't like to eat meat at all. Obviously, I'm not going to tell you that Mediterranean or keto is the way to go. I want you to load up on all this meat. You may not like it at all. Vegan may be the best option for you. And we also don't have to put ourselves in a box. You can kind of go in between. You can be a flexitarian. You can primarily eat vegan and have a little bit of salmon. If you want some protein on Friday night and you're having good salmon for omega-3s, nobody should be judging you. I think that's also another thing. People think that they have to follow this vegan diet hundred percent. And it's really about balance, except for keto. If you're following keto, you really need to be in ketosis or you could actually do more harm because of how much fat you're consuming. So the next slide talks about some of the common things that I talk with my patients about. And again, you know, these are just some general guidelines, but Every single one of those avoid processed carbohydrates and high sugar food like that. Number one, most important thing. If there is one takeaway you have, my recommendation from this is be aware of how much sugar you're putting in your body. You can eat super healthy. You can eat everything from whole foods. You can buy everything organic and you can still have a high sugar diet. And I challenge you to look at the things in your fridge and see how many grams of sugar are in each thing. I have people that every day for lunch, they have a salad. They're putting the best stuff on there. Then they're putting a salad dressing on it with organic cane sugar. One tablespoon has six grams of sugar. They put two tablespoons on. They had 12 grams of sugar in their salad alone, but they thought that was no sugar meal, right? We really try when we think of added sugar that you can read on a food label, especially with cancer, I want it less than 20, if not even less than 10. I want no added sugar. And I'm not referring to the sugar that's in a blueberry. I'm not referring to the sugar that's in a carrot. I have people come in and tell me all the time that they've stopped eating carrots and sweet potato because they're afraid it's gonna make them overweight. But yet you listen to the rest of the food they're eating. It is not the carrot or the sweet potato that's leading to the obesity epidemic. It really is not. 
it's the sodas, the refined carbs. It's the not realizing when you go out to eat that you ate a whole basket of chips and salsa. You know, it's those things that we do on a regular basis that we don't realize. But carbohydrates that are processed and high sugar foods, track them, try to keep them under 20 grams. If you have active cancer, even less, under 10 grams. Very, very, very low. We do not want that sugar. Um, healthy fats, really, you look at Mediterranean, you look at vegan, and you look at keto. Fats are not bad. They all encourage the healthy fats. And of course, it depends which diet you're looking at. Is it avocado, olive oil, salmon, cod? But fats are good. Um, fat is actually the only macronutrient that doesn't eventually get broken down into sugar. So protein, when you have excess protein over time, your body breaks that down to carbs and to sugar. So that's why even on a keto, you have to have moderate protein. You can't do 50-50 fat and protein, or you're not going to be in ketosis because protein can get broken down into carbs and sugar. So fat is actually good. We need to utilize those healthy fats. Red meat and processed meat. I do not think that you need to cut out red meat by any means. I do think you should really reduce processed meats. Um, processed meats and charred meat, which we're gonna you know, talk about down at number six, but those have been shown, there's lots of studies that it increases your risk of cancer. So when it comes to red meat, we really recommend hormone-free, antibiotic-free, organic grass fed. If you're able to do that, I know that's a privilege to be able to do. Um, but if you're able to, it makes a difference because whatever the animal eats is in their tissue and you eat that. So if it's full of antibiotics and hormones and, um, omega sixes, it's not going to be as nutritional as something that is free of those things. Green tea. I always suggest if my patients, if you drink coffee every morning and you got diagnosed with cancer, a quick, easy swap is switching it to green tea. Green tea is really rich in antioxidants. And you look at some of the countries with the lowest cancer um, outcomes, J uh, Japan and China, they drink so much green tea. And we're going to talk at the end at a product I use called capsule tea, where one capsule is equal to 16 cups of decaffeinated green tea. And those antioxidant benefits really have some cancer suppressing properties. Foods that help with detox, we want you detoxing well. Cruciferous veggies, cilantro, parsley, dandelion greens, tea, dandelion tea, chlorophyll, those things that help support detox because that just helps your body process. We breathe in toxins. We have toxins all the time. The overcooking and the charring food we talked about. The dairy is controversial. So there's lots of studies that show that dairy can increase your chance of prostate cancer, but there's other studies on the flip side that show that dairy decreases your risk of col uh, colorectal cancer. So our goal is if you're able to, to choose organic and really stick with fermented forms because those are so good for our gut. So the yogurt and the kefirs and those. Um, increase your intake of vegetables, no matter which one you look at, vegetables are good. We want lots of different color with different antioxidants and um, different nutrients, phytonutrients. Those phytonutrients from plants are huge. And the ground flaxseed is great. There's actually a study that I'll show you about flaxseed and prostate cancer. So upping your ground flaxseed is something that you can easily do that has evidence. And I always say, what is the side effect of making some of these dietary changes? Besides maybe the, like you want the sweets, you want the candy, the candy, once you understand your why for doing it, you're much more able to be consistent and you're, you're using food as medicine. And again, insulin has been shown to stimulate cell growth and turnover over and over and over again. So there is one thing that you can do, monitor your CRP, your set rate inflammation, monitor your insulin. We want to keep inflammation low and insulin low. And that is like the best, easiest thing to do. And insulin is probably $3 through lab quarter run. So here's just a couple that I wanted to highlight. So consuming just 50 grams of processed meat, which is about four slices of bacon or one hot dog, raise the risk of colorectal cancer by 18%. So, you know, that's pretty, if you have a whole family history of colon cancer, 18%, and then you add in your genetics of that 10 to 25%, you're getting up there. So these things make a big difference when you cut out some of the processed foods. The next one, a study found that men with prostate cancer that took 30 grams of ground flaxseed daily had slower cancer growth than the control group in just 30 days. 
So, you know, this is about four tablespoons of ground flaxseed, but that is something you can easily do. You can add ground flaxseed into yogurt. You can add it into smoothies. You can add it into salad dressings. Um, the reason ground flaxseed is so important is if you eat whole flaxseeds, your body actually can't absorb all the benefit from them. So you've got to make sure you do ground or milled flaxseed. Is flaxseed considered a prebiotic? Yes, it is. That. Yep, it's a great prebiotic. So really good too if you have any gut issues. Sugar. So this one's huge, you guys. I can't. You're like Chris, and you're a broken record. I feel like I have to say it like 30 times through the cancer and functional medicine because it's the biggest thing. But this is even outside of cancer. There is a huge correlation between sugar and our immune system. So 75 grams of sugar, which I know that sounds like a lot when I'm telling you to avoid 20 to have 20 grams or less. But the standard American gets 75 grams or more of sugar, and they don't even realize it. When you consume that, it negatively affects the immune system for up to five hours. So they looked at people with sugar, and they looked at CBCs, and they saw shifts, negative shifts in their immune system based on white blood cells, immature white blood cells, after they had high sugar meals. So sugar impacts our immune system, which is obviously really important for cancer, but even for the flu, for COVID, for any of those things, we want a strong, healthy immune system. Sleep. So kind of changing gears and getting into sleep. Sleep is super important when it comes to cancer. And we can talk about that on the next slide. If you guys are somebody that snores a lot, it's really important to get that evaluated. Some people think, oh, well, I just snore. You could have sleep apnea. You could be sleeping for eight hours, but your quality of sleep is horrible. And, you know, the research really shows less than six hours is, is really bad, but too much sleep may also be a problem more than nine hours. So especially the more than nine hours they found with estrogen dominant breast cancers. Um, and I think that's probably more related to movement and estrogen metabolism and things like that. But we really aim for seven to eight hours, but it really does matter. People think, oh, well, sleep, I don't really feel the impact. I feel great on five hours of sleep. We know sleep impacts our brain health, our immune system, hormone balance, regenerating our cells, our recovery. So getting into that deep sleep is where even our connective tissue, our joints, our muscles are recovering from the day. So if you are not sleeping well, you're, you're not going to heal from chemotherapy, from radiation as well. If you're not sleeping well, your hormones are going to get off and you're not going to be able to control your appetite. There are so many studies of sleep deprivation and ghrelin and leptin issues. When I first opened Stat Wellness, I experienced this firsthand. I got up the first year and a half. We were open at 3.30 every single day to be here at Stat. I know it's horrible. Um, I did try to go to bed early, but I still was sleep deprived. I was getting less than six hours of sleep. And I was like, my body's doing well. I was checking on my levels every you know eight to 12 weeks because of where I work. And my levels were all saying fine. And the only thing that I felt was the ghrelin and leptin. I was hungry 24 seven. I was never full, never satisfied. Um, and it's because of ghrelin and leptin. So ghrelin is the growl hormone that tells you you're hungry. And leptin is the hormone that tells you you're full. So when you're sleep deprived, ghrelin is high and leptin is low. So you're hungry all the time. And that is not only sleep, that's also stress. So if you were super stressed out and you come home and you're just binge eating, your body doesn't need all those calories. That hunger is lying to you. So you've got to address the root issue and get your ghrelin and leptin back in balance. Why is that important as we talk about cancer? Because insulin, inflammation, feeding the cancer cells, glucose, but also that body composition component. So very, very important. Um, and, uh, there's a lot more information. Sleep foundation has tons of studies on, um, cancer and sleep, which is great. So let me, let me just jump in here because you, you mentioned yep. Uh, sleep deprivation and anyone who knows me is going to know that I'm a big fan of, of sending people for sleep studies and then getting them over to sleep medicine but you know a classic patient in our office that is in need of all of this is the heavy set 50 year old man right we can even make it more complicated by saying now he was just diagnosed with prostate cancer and so he's heavy set which means that he's most likely has sleep apnea, which means that he's and it, it, it hasn't been diagnosed yet, which means that he's sleeping poorly, which means that he's hungry all the time, which means that he keeps getting heavier. The <laughs> yes. more heavy he gets, the more his testosterone goes down. The more he eats poorly, the more his inflammation goes up. The, more, the less sleep he gets, the more this revolving circle happens. 
It's so true. And you know, a lot of times our patients don't even know they're not getting good sleep because it's been a lifelong thing and they're exhausted all the time, but they're like, I just, I work long hours. And so on the, on the next slide, I talk about like the aura ring. I always encourage people, if you're able to, you should wear a sleep tracker. I find it to be the most interesting thing. Um, the other thing that we're really big on that I didn't put on here anywhere, but we do a lot of continuous glucose monitors and not for the diabetic or pre-diabetic. We do it for everybody. And part of the reason is our patients. So this is an interesting thing, but melatonin at night, our pineal gland in response to, to darkness secretes melatonin. Melatonin tells our pancreas to stop making insulin so that our blood sugar doesn't drop as we fast for eight hours. A lot of people, what do they do before they go to bed? They're on electronics. What do electronics do? It's not a dark room. So it does not let the pineal gland produce as much melatonin as it should. So what happens? They're sleeping and their blood sugar is dropping. Their body doesn't like it. Their brain doesn't like it. So they're not getting good quality rest. And this is something that we saw. We've done about four rounds now of blood sugar boot camps, And our patients were like, I had no idea. Their blood sugar was dropping to 40, like three or four times throughout the night. And they were getting, they were waking up sweating. They were putting their leg out. They were putting their leg in. They were putting their leg out. That is interrupting their sleep quality. So we actually had them add a little bit of a nighttime, like protein, healthy fat snack. And we had them focus on sleep hygiene, which is everything on this page. And the biggest thing that made a difference, turning off electronics and not being on their phone before they go to bed, their blood sugar stopped dropping. And it's because of the melatonin and the role, our body, everything it does, it does it for a reason. Melatonin is not important only for our sleep, but it's also signaling to our body. It helps us not have to urinate in the night all the time, right? You may go to the bathroom every four hours while you're awake, but why do you make it eight hours at night without going to the bathroom? Maybe if you are going multiple times a night, come see Dr. Greenstein or pelvic physical therapy. Get your, get your sleep study. Uh, that's yeah, get your sleep study. Time. All of that. So important. So we really aim for seven to eight hours. We don't want you even close to the six and we don't want you over nine, even though I know people are like, I feel great on 10 evidence says differently. Um, we want you to track your sleep and know what percentage of deep sleep you're getting. That's actually the one I care about the most. I recommend keeping your room cool, 65 degrees Fahrenheit. My patients tell me all the time, one of their spouses does not want the room at 65 degrees Fahrenheit. They make a chill pad so you can put it on your side of the bed and you can set it at 65 degrees so you can get good quality sleep. The temperature plays a role. Uh, Keep your room super dark. Consider getting white noise. If you hear little creaks, cracks, anything like that, white noise makes a difference. Please, please, please turn off electronics. One of the best things you can do for that pineal gland and melatonin production, follow a consistent bedtime routine. I think about my seven month old, she needs to do the same things to tell her mind it's time to go to sleep every night before bed. Those bedtime routines are really important to tell our body it's time to relax, to start making melatonin and to get ready to go to sleep. Um, And if you're still struggling, get support, get a sleep study done, see a sleep specialist, maybe come and see us and think about like, is there a hormonal component? Maybe your cortisol is way too high at night, which is your stress hormone. Um, We do use things like melatonin and magnesium, valerian root, lemon balm, sometimes just chamomile tea. Uh, And we're going to actually talk, I think the next one talks about melatonin. There's a lot of exciting new research about melatonin when it comes to cancer and longevity, specifically breast cancer, prostate, gastric, and colorectal cancer. I don't know if it's people doing research, but breast cancer and colorectal cancer have so much evidence on them. Like if you're on PubMed, it seems to be where like, there's so much uh, evidence. You're mine. You probably see all the prostate cancer with your line of work, but it's interesting. There's tons of overlap. And so the the data that comes out of the cardiac disease stuff overlaps into my world. Yeah. And it's the same thing with colorectal and breast cancer and things like that. You know, if it's good, if it's going to be good for the whole body, it's going to be good for everything else. And so a lot of the data is, 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 is pulled out of, you know, cardiac studies. In other words, we know that people with sleep disorders have heart disease. Well, get that fixed. And guess what? They don't have prostate disease too, or or, or at least it reduces their risk. All systems work together. I had one question for you. Oh, so the interesting thing, you know, if you you look at all this stuff, you know, so, you know, we've been promoting this for a long time now, and even the smart world of, uh, of devices are getting in on it. Like you can have a setting on your phone to change the appearance of your screen at night why one they want the more on your phone the happier you know apple and (laughs) google and and samsung are because 
you're, you're using their product, but they know that it affects your, um, your, your, your nighttime behavior. And the amount of, of apps and devices out there now, your Apple Watch and things like that, that are there to track your sleep now is awesome. And so like when I, when I have a patient that is in complete denial about their most like sleep condition, uh, I'm like, go record yourself, man. You got a phone, you got a watch, go put it on, go, go, you know, prove me wrong. And yeah. yeah. And there are like, even of course you can set the blue light blocking on your phones and everything, but they do make blue light blocking glasses that are really inexpensive on Amazon. I still prefer for it to be off because you're stimulating your mind. Um, but you can buy those. And I always find it interesting when my patients do blue light blocking and see if they see improvements in their sleep. It's kind of like you're doing your own personal study. Mm -hmm. Um, but melatonin, it's been, we know it's a hormone. We've known it's a hormone forever produced by the pineal gland in the brain, but it's now well accepted in research, which is really exciting that it's cell protective. It's an immune modulator. It has antioxidant properties and actually helps our body make blood components. So this is super, super important. Um, and it may also based on evidence, reduce side effects of chemo and radiation. Natural melatonin production is what is the best, but you can also of course supplement melatonin. And stress, this one's super quick. We know stress plays a role with cancer. And the reason is, we can go to the next one, um, the cortisol connection. So cortisol is not bad. That's our fight or flight. Oh. <laughs> um, so stress is our fight or flight. So it increases. Oh. Let me see if you can, guys can be muted. Oh. I think they have the wrong. Are you able to mute them, Dr. Greenstein? Uh, let's see. Whoever's out there, mute off. Please act. Please turn it off. Teresa, there's a, a microphone at the bottom that you can hit to mute. Hold on, let's oh, see. There we go. They got it. Um, so stress increases cortisol. When chronically elevated cortisol, it will increase your blood sugar, inflammation, and decrease your immune system. So we do not want to have chronically elevated cortisol. Cortisol is not bad though. That is what gets you out of bed, ready to take on the day. It motivates you. It helps you feel deadlines. The natural circadian rhythm with cortisol is that it's highest in the morning and gradually goes down as the day goes on. So that cortisol connection is huge. Ways to manage stress. So there's lots of ways. I just want to hit these quickly because I know we're out of time, but meditation using apps like meditation studio app, breathe, Headspace, Calm, any of those are fantastic for helping to guide you through meditations. Even deep breathing. So one of the things I tell my patient, when you get stopped at a red light, instead of being frustrated that you're stopped at a red light, use that as a reminder to take slow, deep breaths. That's gonna lower your cortisol on your way home and to work. Um, there's a lot of different breathing techniques. There's four, seven, eight, there's four, four. And all that is, is inhaling, holding your breath and exhaling, um, which is really important. That's slow breathing. Epsom salt baths, rich in magnesium, very relaxing. You can even get them with lavender. Reading positive books, having a distraction, writing in a gratitude journal, prayer, all of those things are great ways to manage stress. Because remember, like we talked about at the beginning, stress is a perception, which is really important. Is that it? Next one. Wait, hold on. Oh, there we go. Exercise. So exercise. I think this is our last one before. And I, are you okay with time, Dr. Greenstein? We're fine. This is, okay. we, can go on, we can go on for forever. I just have to, it's my daughter's last day of school. So we're, we're celebrating with ice cream later. So. Oh, good. Well, there's not too much left, but I wanted to make sure to respect your time. So exercise and cancer, really, really important. There's been a lot of studies that have looked at the correlation. We know exercise is really good for our heart health, for inflammation, but it's really important for suppressing the uh, cancer cells in our body. And they looked at a study that looked at voluntary exercise, and they found that more than 60% reduction in tumor across all of the mouse models. So we know that when we exercise, we are able to decrease the size of our tumor cells, which is really exciting. Again, this is used in conjunction with other things, not by itself. And then the next slide talks about the impact on exercise from a quality of life standpoint. And I know a lot of times when our cancer patients are going through chemotherapy and radiation, they don't feel their strongest. They feel weak. They feel like they can't exercise the way they used to. 
And the important thing is, is studies were done and this one looked at even moderate or low intensity exercise. So walking, even just going for a slow walk was shown to prevent fatigue and increase quality of life during cancer treatment. So don't underestimate the power of small movements, but we know it's really important for the prevention of cancer, for keeping that healthy body composition. We've talked about multiple times in this PowerPoint reducing inflammation and improving mood. I always, whenever I think of exercise and mood, I always think of Legally Blonde. You probably have not seen it, have you? Um, I have a 10 year old daughter, about 10. Okay, if not okay. Yeah. So it was, you know, from ever ago and they just talk about, well, exercise releases endorphins. Endorphins make you happy. Happy people don't kill their husbands. Yeah. And it's just true. The more you move your body, the more you exercise, the better your quality of life is in your mood. And when we think even beyond the physical effects, if your mood is better, you make healthier nutrition choices. If you've moved your body, you sleep better. And all of these things that we've talked about, exercise is a best anti-depression, um, anti-stress, something you can do and there's no side effects to it as long as you're exercising safely and not hurting your joints. Um, but it's very, very, very important. And so it can't be undermined the importance of moving our body. And don't forget to deactivate your thionogoclate after a perm. Oh yeah. <laughs> you remember. Yes. Or you'll get caught. Yeah, um, I got the daughter. So I'll do oh that. yeah. Oh yeah. My, well, you'll have to tell her it's one of my favorite. Every time I, like I, every time I think of exercise and mood, I go back to that line. Um, so tips to move more. I think that, you know, everybody knows that they need to do these things. Like when you talk to anybody and you're like, is exercise good? Nobody says like, no, exercise is horrible. Um, but why are we not doing it? Why are only 20% of Americans getting the recommended daily movement? It's, you know, it's kind of mind blowing, but I think the reason is behavior change is the hardest. And so here's just some super quick tips. My suggestion to all my patients on Sunday, look at your week ahead of you. Put workouts in like you would any other work meeting. When are you gonna get time for you to do your workouts? And you have to think of those as something on your calendar, like you are meeting with your boss. You would not all of a sudden last minute cancel a meeting with your boss. You stay accountable to that. I think it's really important to plan for success. I also really recommend doing it first thing in the morning if your schedule allow, because things always come up, right? If you try to work out at 5.30 or 6 p.m., things always come out, come up. Lay out your clothes the night before. I think that's so important to be prepared. Have your clothes ready, know what you're putting on. Put your alarm or your phone on the other side of the room if that's how you wake up. So you're already getting out of bed. And one of the most important things is find something that you like to do. Your workout does not need to look like your neighbors. If your neighbor is doing CrossFit and you hate CrossFit, don't try to do CrossFit as your workout, right? If you love yoga, do more yoga. If you love to dance, dance. Any movement is good. We need to be moving our bodies. And I really focus on upping the neat factor. So there's been a lot more studies that have come out and they're really starting to call sitting the new smoking. So they were looking at people and this is a really sad reality that woke up every morning to hit the gym. They worked out for 45 minutes every morning and did what they were supposed to do. And they sat the other 23 hours of the day. And they found that the benefit of that 45 minute exercise and the sitting for 23 hours negated itself. And so they say sitting is the new smoking. In America, a lot of people are starting to, they're not smoking as much, but what are they doing more of sitting? They sit in their cars as they commute. They sit in their office, they come home and they wanna veg out and they sit more. Then they go sleep, they're laying down, then they wake up and they do it over again. So the neat factor is non-exercise activity thermogenesis. That's what are you burning? What are you activating? throughout the day outside of that purposeful exercise. And for some people, that's all I start with is, can you park further away? Can you walk up and down every aisle? Can you use the bathroom at your office that's further away? Can you go to the further away water fountain? Can you track your steps? Getting you know 8,000 and 10,000 steps is our goal. And I always encourage people, if you are very far from that, let's say you're getting 2,000 steps a day, a good goal for you is to get 4,000. You know, Set realistic goals, but movement is key. Yeah, the, the other things that I've told people to do is get a standing desk. Yes. And if they want to really invest to get a treadmill that goes underneath their desk and they just walk literally at like 0 0.1, 0 0.2. And they're just, they're, they're basically taking a stroll as they're sitting at their desk. And that was done. That was something that I saw many, many, many years ago. And I was fat. I thought that was awesome. 
so fast. And when you're going that slow, it's very easy to keep it up. You know, yeah. it's not, you don't feel too overworked. You're still able to get your work done. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing about that walking, which is so great, is when you walk, you use the right, the right and the left side of your brain communicate better. So if you're not even doing it from an athletic standpoint or a blood sugar standpoint, you'll increase your work performance when you walk more throughout the day because you're thinking creatively and analytically better. Um, so labs, what are some things we look at? Some of these are basic and some are more functional. So for our patients with cancer, we're always looking at their CRP, their SED rate. We want to see that their inflammation is super low. Recently, LabCorp changed the range for C-reactive protein for just a quantitative CRP, zero to 10, which is like mind blowing that a CRP of five is considered normal. For us, we want it less than one. We monitor CRPs and we want it non-existent. Unlike other things, there's no benefit of having C-reactive protein in the body. So we want it as low as possible. We look at vitamin D, as we discussed earlier, we look at blood sugar so closely. We look at fasting glucose, we look at insulin, and we look at hemoglobin A1C in every single one of our patients. And the reason is we want to catch a problem before there's a problem. Also another wide range. When you think of insulin, the range is like two to 24.9. So you can go in for a fasting insulin and be at 15 and you're normal. To us, that's a very high fasting insulin that's gonna drive up inflammation. We like it less than seven and a half in a fasting state. Um, we don't let you get into the pre-diabetic or diabetic zone. We want you having a lower hemoglobin A1C, which is that average blood sugar. We also do what functional tests. So we do full nutritional evaluations. We want to look at all of your amino acids, your glutathione, your heavy metals. We want to look at your antioxidants because what better way to improve one, how you feel through treatment, but also how your body was designed to work. When you have series of nutritional deficiencies, it's going to impact so many different processes in your body. So zinc and vitamin D, fatty acids. We talked about the role of the immune system and inflammatory cascade, really important. We already talked about the omega check. Homocysteine goes with methylation. So we look at homocysteine and B9 and B12 in everybody. And we do comprehensive stool analysis. So we look at the good bacteria in your gut, not only for bad. So a lot of people, when they go in a CGI and they're having gut issues, they may do a stool culture or like an OMP where they're looking to see, is there parasites or bad bacteria like salmonella? But a lot of people, the problem is not necessarily that they have something pathogenic or disease causing in their gut. The problem is they just have no lactobacillus. They have no bifidobacterium, which are some of the most beneficial bacteria. And this is really important for our chronic UTI patients, our interstitial cystitis patients. We look at how is this all connected, right? Do you have a good gut microbiome? It's all connected. There's even studies now coming out, probiotics and kidney function. It's all connected. So very, very important. And then we do also, they are not perfect markers by any means, but in our patients that are looking for prevention or in our patients that have strong family histories of cancer, we will look at things like a CEA or a CA-125 and kind of get a good baseline, things like PSA, of course, as well with prostate. And we want to make sure that they're nice and low and we look for fluctuations and then we may do some more screening. So certain things like we've caught ovarian cancer, there's really no screening for ovarian cancer and we've caught it based on CEA levels being elevated. So we do like to look at some of those cancer markers that are not perfect tests, but they are, we look for change in the really high risk um, population or in people that have had a history of cancer in the past. And then the last area is some of the things that we use outside of nutrients and everything we've talked about in functional medicine. So we use Capsol tea. Um, this is what I was referring to earlier. That's a high dose green tea, and it also has a chili powder in it. So one capsule is equivalent to 16 cups of decaffeinated green tea. So it will not keep you awake. Um, but they've done some studies. They looked at oncoblots, which look at where cancer originated in the body. And they saw suppressions based on the ENOX2, which is a molecule that has cancer activity in the body. So they have some PubMed articles out based on Capsol T, but it's really those antioxidant properties that are so beneficial. The crazy thing about Capsol T though, is you have to take one capsule every four hours and you have to take an immediate release and a sustained release before you go to bed to make it eight hours until you start your every four hours with Capsol T. Um, but I think it's something really good to do in conjunction with conventional medicine to slow the progression. 
Curcumin, we love curcumin. Um, there was a study that looked at just even in 30 days doing four grams of curcumin could reduce cancer lesions in the colon by 40%. Um, and they looked at placebo, four grams and two grams. And it really does seem to be dose dependent. The results were seen at four grams, but not the same results at two grams. But curcumin is very anti-inflammatory. Again, just like we talked about with omega-3s, curcumin thins the blood. But this is something that we recommend supplementing with a high quality curcumin. This is one of the supplements that commonly has heavy metals in it. So it's important to make sure you get it from a company that does third-party testing and verifies that there's no heavy metals. I've actually had a family from India that they always, when they go to India, bring back a ton of curcumin for their family. And um, they actually, their kids all had dangerous, toxic levels of lead. And they were very determined to figure out where it was from because they didn't have an old house with lead paint. And so they sent their turmeric to a lab to get tested themselves. And it came back with like dangerously high lead levels. So just so you guys are aware, not all supplements are created equal and the FDA doesn't regulate them. So it's very important to know that they've been third-party tested, that they're high quality and don't just take random things that you don't know anything about and talk to your healthcare provider. And then low dose naltrexone. So I always joke that I feel the way about low dose naltrexone that a cardiologist feels about statins, um, that I think low dose naltrexone should be in our water system in the United States. Kristen, what's naltrexone? Just go over what that is. So low dose naltrexone is very different than naltrexone. And this is what's really fascinating. Naltrexone is used in conventional medicine a lot at doses of 50 to 100 milligrams. And naltrexone really, they use it with people when they overdose on opioid, uh, which is morphine, Dilaudid, or if they are going through addiction, withdraws, they'll use naltrexone, 50 to 100 milligrams. Low dose naltrexone is never more than 4.5 milligrams. And often people are started on 0.5 or 1.5 milligrams. And low dose naltrexone binds to our own op opioid receptor sites, and it really reduces inflammation and calms down the immune system. So at 3 a.m. is really when our endorphins and our opioid receptors are the highest. So we wake up typically with the most inflammation. And so we use low dose naltrexone for autoimmune disease. That's a huge thing we see improvements with. Hashimoto's, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and we actually have more rheumatologists in the Atlanta area that are supporting LDN, which is making me so excited. Um, unfortunately, there's, there's some research, but there's not a ton of research because low-dose naltrexone is not available as a regular prescription at Walgreens. CVS, Publix, they only have naltrexone at the much higher doses, and it is used for a totally different reason. And so you have to look at LDN when you're looking at the science. Um, but because of its role on the immune system and inflammation, it has a lot of anti-cancer effects. And so there is a really great conversation on the next slide I just pulled. And this is a physician that uses low-dose naltrexone on all of their patients. This was not a good randomized controlled trial. This is like really more conversational, but it's a physician that works with a lot of cancer patients. And so he kind of informally looked at 450 patients with cancer, 270 of them had significant benefits. 86 of them had signs of decreased tumor size by at least 75% and 125 patients were on their path towards remission with low-dose naltrexone. Again, we would never recommend doing low-dose naltrexone alone but I am such a proponent of it. You do have to wait about three months is when you start to see the biggest benefit on inflammation and immune suppression. So this is a more long-term path. This is not like you're gonna do it for a week and see huge improvements, but because it's about 3% of another medication, the side effect profile is so good. The only thing is you don't wanna take it if you ever have surgery and are put on opioids because they bind to each other. So they basically are not as effective either one of them. So you want to come off it about a week before your procedure, and you want to wait until you've been off of the opioids for about a week, and then you start it back up. But other than that, the only side effects we really see is vivid dreams, um, which is actually very common with low-dose naltrexone. And that's why we always start with either 0.5 or 1.5, and then double it after a week, and then we usually don't see any. So it's very, very well tolerated. And there's people in the wellness space that just use it to keep inflammation as low as possible, um, even that don't have autoimmune disease or cancer, uh, but really, really good for autoimmune and cancer. Where are you getting it from? From a compounding pharmacy? 
So we use pavilion compounding for ours. Um, we use so much because I used to send it to Belmar Pharmacy in Colorado because here people were charging like $60 per month and Belmar did $50 for three months. So 90 days was $50. So I called pavilion up and I don't know if pavilion wants me sharing this, but I was like, Hey, I use so much low dose naltrexone. Will you honor the same rate that I get in Colorado? I'd like to keep it here. And they agreed. So like our patients get it for like $52 for 90 days. And I have my patients do it for 90 days. And I monitor in blood work that we see improvement. And really at the 90 days, if I don't see any movement in their markers, I don't keep them on it. Um, but I do see improvement in at least 75% of my patients. I have some younger patients with Crohn's disease that are not using any other therapy, but LDN and their Crohn's is completely controlled. Um, they still have a gastroenterologist. They're getting colonoscopies and everything, but low dose naltrexone is all they needed. Um, I have a lot of people with Hashimoto's that it's cut their thyroid antibodies in half in three months. Um, you pair low dose naltrexone with a gluten-free diet and the Hashimoto's is it's just amazing. So I see a lot of improvements. I do have some people, their CRPs don't move. Um, and so I take them off it, but the majority of my patients, I see huge improvements. And then chemo leave. So this one, um, have you heard of Prolon, Dr. Greenstein? Okay, so Prolon is the first product that they came out with. It was a five-day fasting mimicking diet, and they now are doing chemo leave. And the thing I really like about this, I usually am not a huge proponent of long fast, but they have all they do is put their money back into research. It's the most research-backed like product that I know of. And so right now this is being used in five hospitals. And so they are using it to see if they did a four-day fasting mimicking diet with the nutrients they need for the chemo, how were their side effects? And the results were really good. So it's a four day fasting mimicking diet that you do right before chemotherapy and the side effects, the nausea, vomiting, all of those things were significantly better with chemo leave. What's a fasting mimicking diet? So fasting mimicking diet is where you're still eating food, but your body gets into a fasting state. So you're doing autophagy. So for people that have never heard the term autophagy, that's where your body is recycling some of the dead cells within your body. So really good for anti-aging. But when you're looking at reducing your inflammation before you go through something like chemotherapy, you're kind of cleaning out your system so it can handle the toxic load of chemotherapy better. Um, it's really pretty fascinating. So fasting mimicking diet inside this box is food. So you eat food, but it's very low in calorie and it's all vegan. And this one's four days. Prolon is five days. Prolon was what they started as. And they started seeing people have improvements by doing Prolon before chemo. So then they've started the second line of their business, which is still like being currently studied. Um, and I just, I love that the company is very evidence-based. And so you should look at Prolon, their website too. We use it for people that are really inflamed, that have insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, obesity, um, will measure visceral fat on the body composition and do the five day fasting mimicking diet. Um, I love it. My mental clarity when I do it is so, so good. Um, but it's not for anybody with a history of eating disorders at all, because you're dropping your calories significantly for the four or five days. Uh, but it's, it's really pretty cool. So just another thing that's out there from a cancer standpoint, that's looking at food as medicine. So someone can do this periodically just to kind of like cleanse themselves out as opposed to doing a cleanse. Yes. And you would want to be doing Prolon, which is P-R-O-L-O-N. And Prolon is the one that you do. They recommend doing it quarterly for maintenance. If you have a therapeutic thing you're doing it for, five days on, 25 days off. Five days on, 25 days off. You obviously can't stay on it permanently because you're in a fasting state. Hmm. Um, but the five days, it's it's really remarkable, the results. And I actually think it's pretty good. There's like soups in there. There's kale crackers. There's green olives. Wow. Um, there's nut bars you have in the morning. So it's pretty good. Nice. Right. And then that was the end. So I was going to tell you guys to make sure to check out Stout Wellness and um, listen to the Little Buy podcast. I'm actually going to be having Dr. Greenstein on there. I'm so excited. Um, but it's it's been so good to talk to you guys tonight. And uh, I know that was a lot of information. And we went about an hour and 20 minutes. So Ooh. we went a little over. Awesome. All right. I, I have a couple of questions here. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, 
cut questions and comments. So the so one of the analogies I, I've used in the past, and if anybody has any questions while we're just chatting here, there is a chat bar. You know, you can you can kind of type in your questions and stuff like that. We're going to ask that you not talk, uh, but you can type in like, hey, what do you think of this? And hey, what do you think of that? But the analogy that I'll use for patients, especially my guy patients, is um, is they is treating their body like a car. Majority of guys are going to come in. They love their car. Their car is clean. It is, it's oiled. It, it, the tires are rotated. Um, you know, the gas is perfect. You know, whatever, whatever you do for, for maintaining your car, but they're 50 pounds overweight. They're snoring. They're, they, you know, they got a Coca-Cola in hand and a, and a Hershey bar in their back pocket. And so they're not, they have no interest in taking care of their body, but they're more than happy to take care of their car. And so that's something that I, I, I see. Um, just a couple of things. Can you, do you have like two seconds to talk about the brain gut barrier? Yeah, that's huge. So the brain gut connection, they really call your gut the second brain. So if you guys have not heard of that, um, you should look it up because we have more neurons lining our digestive tract than we even have in our brain. And so they, you've always heard the study, I have butterflies or that gut feeling. And that is actually a neurological change that's happening within your gut. And that is a real thing. So the brain gut connection is huge before. So there's a lot of ways to describe this, but one of the biggest things, the serotonin that we talked about before is huge. when we think of the brain gut connection. So depression, anxiety, those are two things we think of as up here issues, actually finding they're actually gut issues. So 90% of your serotonin made there. So that is huge. And then the other thing that we saw is IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. So we used to think it was a brain gut connection. A lot of times when you got the IBS diagnosis, the treatment was SSRIs. They put people on antidepressants and they saw that their gut symptoms improved. And so for the longest time in science, we thought it was a brain gut issue. Well, now science is flipping and it's saying, no, your gut is the second brain. This is actually a gut brain issue. And the reason SSRIs are helping is because your gut is not making the serotonin appropriately. So your gut has more neurons than your brain has. And it's where a lot of serotonin stems, the gut feeling, the butterflies is true. The brain gut connection is a real thing. So if you're depressed, if you're anxious, um, if you have ADD, ADHD, trouble focusing, the first place you should look is your gut. So what are you eating? How is your gut microbiome? Are you getting fiber, prebiotics? Are you going to the bathroom every day? Is it a Bristol stool chart two? I mean, four, you want to be a four. Um, so check it out. Um, so really important. We should make t-shirts for how does your stool look? I know. <laughs> yeah. I talk to my patients about it all the time. Yeah, I know. All right. Can you, how do you measure visceral uh, fat? So visceral means like what's around your intestines on the inside, as opposed to like pinching the back of your elbow or your, or your tummy to measure adipose tissue. So what's, what's the, how do you measure visceral fat? So we do the in-body, which has been studied next to DEXAFIT, which is a DEXA scan to look at visceral fat. And they were almost identical. But this one, you don't have to lay down for the machine's not huge. There's no radiation and it only takes about a minute to do. Um, but it's basically electrical pulses where they're looking at the density of tissue. So it goes through your legs and through your hands and it's sending these waves. And so they can see what is fat, like body fat percent, what is visceral fat, what is lean muscle mass, what is your lean muscle mass on each extremity? So we can look at the right side versus the left side. But this is very, very important to us because as Dr. Greenstein mentioned, visceral fat, you can never feel. And I hate the term, but it you've probably have heard skinny fat. So there are people that look very in shape and they have a horrible diet and they get on our body composition scan, their body fat percent is 19%. It's actually fantastic. Like on the very low end for a female, but their visceral fat is at 14. And we want that less than 10. I even like it less than five. That visceral fat is very, very important when we think of diabetes, stroke, heart disease, inflammation, everything. But it's not what you can feel. So anything around your abdomen you can feel, that's adipose tissue. That is not visceral fat. We see it a lot with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease too, of course. I was going to say, so is it is an example of visceral fat, the beer belly? So 
you probably have visceral fat too, but the beer belly, are you saying because it's hard and you can't squeeze anything? <laughs> no, it just, just that, you know, we have these these guys that come in that, you know, you know, their their stomach is they have skinny legs, skinny arms. Uh, maybe they have diabetes, maybe they don't. Uh, they look like they're going to have that metabolic syndrome, uh, which is uh, high cholesterol, obesity, um, low pressure, insulin resistance, uh, things okay. like that. And, you know, they got this gut that hangs over their belt buckle. Yes. And so is and that it? Yes. Sometimes it's obvious like that. And sometimes it's not. So like you can have a very large belly and you do have a lot of visceral fat, but we also have people with like a pretty fairly normal size belly and their visceral fat is still really high because their diet is so full of sugar yeah. and that sugar is broken and stored. Right. So we, we had, a, we had a patient, I had a patient many, many months ago who I diagnosed with really bad prostate cancer and he was in just, he was a mess looking. And he took his sweet time to come up with a plan on what to do. He was really nervous. And I, I really, I was convinced he needed surgery because it was based on his disease. It was his best option for, for remission. And he had four months to lose weight. And I said, please make this go. Please make your tummy go away. Please eat this, eat that. Gave him my handouts, everything I could think of. Go call, you know, call your primary care doctor, whatever you can do. Never did. My partner who does all of our robotics said that was one of the hardest surgeries he had to do because there was so much intra-abdominal fat that, that it was just, it just didn't have to be that way. And, and, and he's going to have a harder time recovering now. But, um, so a, a comment on C-reactive protein. There's actually a study that came out many, many moons ago showing elevated C-reactive protein corresponds with prostate cancer survival. I, I don't remember the details of the study on because it's something that's off the beaten path. But the interesting thing is that we don't check that. When we, you know, check your PSA, sometimes we have to check a testosterone, you know, we'll check your CBC. We standard of care is to not check your C-reactive protein. I know. That's something I've always thought about. The only time they check CRPs consistently in conventional medicine is heart disease. And okay. it's really mind blowing to me because I think it is one of the best longevity, longevity and disease markers. And it's super affordable. It's not a crazy expensive test. C-reactive protein is not expensive to run. Yeah. Um, and it tells you so much about your overall health. And we take, as I said, everything seriously. If you get a CRP at three or four, you need to be working on reducing inflammation. I mean, yeah. that needs to be less than one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to comment on the, on the vitamin D, huge vitamin D fan. My guys are, you know, my testosterone guys are on it. My prostate cancer guys, at least, you know, I try to get them on it. Um, vitamin D is just, is, I think it's just so underrated and yep. getting, it just needs to be looked at more and more and more. Um, and then the last thing, you know, you, you touched a little bit, but for the dieting stuff, intermittent fasting, you know, oh, I intermittent fast. You know, like guys come in, girls come in. Well, got two seconds on that one? I do. I'm actually really excited. I'm on a girl that's going through her DNP. I'm one of her advisory boards and she's doing a study on intermittent fasting and the role of gender, um, which I'm super excited. And when she finishes that study, I'll have to share it with you because- Intermittent fasting works for some, for sure. And I can find study to prove that intermittent fasting does work. I do think there's a very big difference between males and females. I think males, their body is more stress adapt. Like if you think all the way back to hunters and gatherers and going and, you know, getting food and not eating for extended period of time, I have men that they'll do 16, 20 hour fasts. Their testosterone levels go up. They, their insulin goes down, their inflammation's down, they're getting leaner, they feel amazing. There is good studies to show that. I have some women that do the same thing because their husband is, and their cortisol is going through their roof, their thyroid looks horrible, they're gaining weight, they're binge eating. So I do think gender plays a role, and I think the time of day plays a role. A lot of us tend to skip breakfast because it's easy, so we like to eat from like 12 to 8 o'clock. We eat for those eight-hour windows. 
But I really think the better approach is flipping the fast and there's more people that are coming out. We should eat breakfast and we should stop eating earlier in the day. And the reason it gives, it gives us a good amount of time to fully digest our food. So when we're going to rest, we're actually getting good quality sleep and restorative sleep. When you are eating in this narrow window, let's say you go to bed at 10 o'clock and 8 p.m. is your heaviest meal of the day you're still going to be digesting when you go to sleep. And that's going to impact your quality of sleep because your body's working to digest. So intermittent fasting, if you're a male and you have insulin resistance, if your insulin is high and you're a male, chances are if you start cutting back on the windows of what you're eating, your insulin is going to go down. Um, if you're a female, I don't think that's always true, especially if you're a menstruating female. I think there's a lot of infradian rhythms, which we talk about with women. We're di- women are not tiny men is like what we like to say. Um, biology wise, we're very different. Men follow a circadian rhythm. Women follow an infradian rhythm. So what would they follow? What? Infradian rhythm. It's like a 28 day rhythm. So it's a longer, so a follicular phase versus a luteal oh, phase okay. is not the same at all. So we call it an infradian rhythm. And that's where a lot of research, you know, for the longest time, they didn't even look at women in research studies because of the difference in hormones and cycles and everything like that. Um, Or like heaven forbid, they get pregnant in the middle of a study, you know? So a lot of studies were done on men. We're getting more women in studies, but it, it's important to realize even a female in different parts of the month, the way they break down carbohydrates, the way they manage stress, the way their cortisol looks, how many calories they burn is so different. So that was a very, very long answer, but there is some good research to support intermittent fasting, but I don't think it's kind of like keto. It's not a, you can't put yourself in a box and it's good for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Last question. If you, are you able to give me a percentage of the pay and this, this, you, you can say, I'll talk about this offline. How many patients are compliant with your regimens? So honestly, we have really compliant patients. And the reason is, is because they're invested. So I think if I had a primary care practice that took insurance and I saw, you know, 40 patients a day and they were just checking off that they came in for a physical, my compliance would be super low to match uh, American statistics, but people are coming in paying cash pay to see us and they're invested in their health. So they are more compliant. I think the hardest thing is people don't realize the times they're not compliant, how often that happens. So like our patient that, you know, is really, really struggling to lose weight and doing everything we're having them do, but we don't, they don't realize that because they bake once a week and they eat those, you know, muffins and cupcakes four times a week, even though they're doing the other 80% that they should, Mm -hmm. all of that sugar builds up and adds. So, you know, there's sneaky things, but people that come and see us, they really, I would say 75% compliant. It's a, it's utterly de, to me disgusting that that I have to slam out X amount of patients per day, not give people the time, treat people after they've become sick, but cannot make a living seeing thirty people a day, preventing them from getting sick, yeah. and the insurance companies have no interest in this none well and the biggest thing that i always tell people like we have really great sick care like as a country and like what you do like i'm i can't do what you do like you're fantastic at what you do and i will always refer out to urologists cardiologists seriously but like it's a sick care model like i have somebody with a high psa and they come and see you i have somebody you know and the problem is a lot of people now are becoming a lot more Uh, empowered on their health and understanding that our, our healthcare system is not working um, for prevention. It's like, you know, if people have cancer, they want to be in the United States. If they need heart surgery, they want to be in the United States. But if you look at the American statistics, we're becoming more overweight. We're becoming more obese. We're having more chronic disease. 86% of all of our healthcare costs go to managing chronic disease. And you know, that healthcare costs is trillions of dollars per year. And that is managing chronic disease. And I just, I, I wish that we changed the name. I think that like healthcare, if we're going to have healthcare in the United States, we need to start putting emphasis on health. Sick care. It is sick care. It yeah. really is. Yeah. I know it's, it's just, it, it, it blows my mind every time. And, you know, when I'm in the office and I see certain things, um, my, you know, I'm always thinking, all right, what, what can I do to keep this guy or girl out of my office in 10 years? 
And so like a classic example is, is the patient that got scared with an elevated PSA, whether they watch their health or not, you know, let's pretend that they're super healthy and they're, they're trying their best to eat well, but they got genetically high cholesterol. And so they take a little bit of this, but they walk two miles a day. And then they come to me with a big anxiety attack because their PSA is seven. And we do our biopsy because that's what we have to do. And it's negative. And I put down this whole path of what can we do to keep you away from me? And I literally start the conversation like that. I'm like, I'm watching pomegranates and flaxseed and I want and vitamin D. And I'm a big fan of a baby aspirin every day because of the whole idea of fighting the inflammation. Yes. And so, but I don't have those people in my office 10 years in advance, you know? And so, yeah, I know. Box, but so I know. I'm going to conclude. This was awesome. One hour and 40 minutes. This was amazing. I could talk about this for hours because I think it's just, I, I'm fascinated with this. I, I, you know, I like urology. I like helping guys do their thing and women do their thing and, and all the, the, the genitourinary uh, health that I manage. But the, I think this is just utterly fascinating. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tie things up here. Um, this is, uh, so I want to thank Kristen Oja for helping us out. She's at Stat Wellness, uh, down in Atlanta, uh, her website, easy statwellness.com. And, um, and if anybody has questions, you know, they can always, you know, go to their website, uh, uh, link in with them. People, people know how to get me, you know, through my office and, and stuff like that. And, uh, I think we're going to have to find a, uh, another subject. Like, like when we talked many weeks ago, Kristen, I think we should do an entire subject on acromancia and the gut flora. <laughs> yes. Yes. I can share more about my research study too, because it's such an important area. So, yeah. important. so, so I'm going to say good night to everybody. Thank you so much, Kristen. This was great. Say hi to everybody at your office. And, Thank you uh, so much. And have a great night, everybody. Have fun with your daughter. Oh, yeah. We're, we got to go celebrate the end of school. Yeah. Tell her congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.